what's going on guys it is brian and jack with some men's comics and in this video we're giving you the top 10 underrated x-men keys according to bolo himself isn't that right jack oh absolutely yeah these are 10 books that you got to be on the lookout for because a lot of people are sleeping on them that's right so we still are in quarantine if anyone's watching this at a later date you guys know about that COVID-19. And if you're watching right now, you definitely know about COVID-19. I got beanie on because my hair's starting to grow out like a Chia pet. But either way, we're getting into it right now, starting with number 10. And at number 10, we got X-Men number four from that 1991 series, right? Yeah, and I know your initial reaction, and we're going to get a couple of reactions from you with this list, no doubt, has got to be, what's underrated about this book? It's got to be one of the hottest X-Men book out right now, and there's no doubt about that. But here's the thing, Brian, I've really become a true believer about this book. The, the amount of ferocity that the back issue market has shown for this character and this issue, every time a rumor comes up, this book is spiking. Omega Red shows up on a secret variant in House of X, Powers of 10. Boom. Book is spiking. Omega Red shows up within the publication six months later. This book is spiking. It doesn't take much to spike this book. That makes me believe that when we finally see this character in a feature film or on the Disney Plus network, this book has the potential to absolutely explode. I want to see him on a tuna can selling omega-3 fatty acids with omega red. And he could probably sell them. <laughs> if people buy it, you know what? I'd probably buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I see tuna cans and now the hot days, the, the packets, he just are awful. Either way. Coming in at number nine, we get Uncanny X-Men number 221. Now, this is another one. Seems like a no-brainer. First appearance of Mr. Sinister. This is a book that you have seen on every top and hot list on YouTube and all over the internet. There's no doubt this book is heavily talked about. But the beauty of this is the amount of supply of this book have really slowed down its growth. Also, everything that's going on with the comic market has really brought this book back down to earth. The reality is... We saw this book with Mr. Sinister get popular, House of X, Powers of Ten, with, with the whole in, reintroduction of Mr. Sinister into the storyline. He was front and center, and this book saw it on the back issue market. We also have constant rumors of Mr. Sinister being a major bad within the upcoming X-Men franchise on the MCU. There's no doubt he's made for that. We saw those little Easter eggs in the Fox film franchise. So we can only hope we're going to see Mr. Sinister in, in going forward. But the reality is I put this one in the same category that I put Omega Red because I sit there and I say, whether I like this character, whether I see this character as this next big thing, the fact that so many people do mean that when this actually comes to fruition, there's going to be a lot of people very excited and there's going to be people going after this book. The, the interest in this character is immense, so much so that I think that at some point they've got to do this. Yeah, I think the great thing about this list, the books we've talked about, the books we're getting ready to talk about on this list and any other X-Men list right now is – that merger, that acquisition from Disney opened up so many avenues. People were probably thinking they had a different mindset when it was just under Fox. But now that you come under Disney, that whole Marvel Universe, things change. And that's part of the reason why you're seeing a bunch of lists and you're seeing a lot of movement on some of these issues. And then coming in at number eight, we get new X-Men number 128. Now here you get the first appearance of Phantom X. This really plays more into X-Force, but Phantom X is really one of those cult popular characters, um, kind of like a Deadpool to a smaller degree. But you're talking about a character who really has seen ebbs and flows on the back issue market. There were times- I was gonna say, you, th uh, this was one that got hot a couple years ago, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, and it's, again, it's because of just really the cult popularity. Um, every now and again, when people get kind of introduced to Phantom X, they, they're all over it. They jump all over it. Um, so that is one of those things where I sit there and I go, okay, as this, as you mentioned, this X-Men franchise has now been opened wide with the whole Disney uh, move that, you know, I sit back and I start saying, well, okay, well, what characters do I think if Disney did them? would fans really latch on to? Phantom X is one of those characters. And because at one point this was like a hundred dollar book, the fact that it's trading for like 2025 means it's got room to grow. 
And then coming to number seven, this is a book we also talked about in another video series. We have Hot and Cold, when we're talking about Gambit being hot. If you haven't watched that yet, make sure you go back and watch that. Also, if you're unaware of it, if, make sure you hit that subscribe button, click that bell notification. That way you'll always be notified when future videos drop. But in at number seven, we get that uncanny X-Men annual number 14, the true appearance, right? Yeah, this is the true first appearance of Gambit. First time he appears. It's just not that sexy first appearance. It's kind of an overhead shot from a distance. <laughs> it, 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 I get why people want to call it a cameo. Um, I don't agree with that whole concept in general. So you guys know where I stand on that, that I really feel like this is a first appearance. But either way, there is a growing number of people who sit in my camp. And because of that, we're seeing a lot of these cameos start to really rise in value. People don't realize a lot of these books exist. Forever, people have been chasing Uncanny X-Men 266. And every time there's some news about Gambit, like the news or rumors that spiked this character in general that had us talking about him on the upside of three up and three down, Gambit really has only ever been popularized by that uncanny X-Men 266. That's the one that everybody chases. Anytime you talk about that character, that's the book. Plus it's on the cover. Right. It's one of those, it's too perfect to be true. And that's the case. It, whether we're talking about Venom or Carnage, it is consistent with that era of Marvel Comics. So it's one of those things where I'm not saying that this book is going to overtake mm -hmm. Uncanny X-Men 266, nor should it. No. I'm just simply saying your room to grow on this book is a lot larger right now. And it's a cheaper buy in. I see these books regularly for $5 in bins. I see this book at times even lower because the, the dealer doesn't even realize really the significance of this book. So this is a book to be on the lookout, especially when you can get out of your house, stay quarantined. But when you can get out of your house, this is a great one to go out and search for. But until then, it's one to be looking for online because you can find them cheap still, even on eBay. Number six, we get X Factor number five. His, a lot of these books we're talking about, we saw a spike a couple of years ago. They kind of gone down again, but we are still seeing they always carry that following and a lot of people be on the lookout for. Yet, we also feel they're undervalued, which is why you have this list. Right, and this is on the list for two reasons that we've already talked about. First, it's a cameo versus first full. So because six is the more attractive book, five gets quite often overlooked. So much so, we're seeing it again show up in $5 bins regularly. Um, you know, I've heard it, a lot of people say, well, I see that book everywhere for $5, $10. That's the point. But there was a time when that wasn't the case. It was a $50, $60, $75 book. When was that time, Brian? Well, it, like you mentioned earlier, it was when that – Fox had hold of the franchise and we were going to get Apocalypse in the film franchise. Everyone was so excited. People were putting major money in it. They thought it was going to be Fox is Thanos. And it really should have been. But man, did Fox screw the pooch. Bad execution. One. Man, yeah, terrible, terrible, terrible. Awesome play call, very poor execution. So ultimately, we're getting kind of the wipe the slate clean. We get a reboot. I wouldn't expect to see Apocalypse right off the bat because that bad taste is still in everybody's mouth. But there's no doubt that that is a card that Marvel is holding up under their sleeve. Disney's holding there. And at some point, we're going to see the living monolith on the big screen or maybe on the Disney Plus network. Either way, this is a book to be on the lookout for because it's just too cheap. You can't pass it up for five to ten bucks. Yeah, and it's one of those characters you can't put baby in the corner. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And then hitting the list at number five, we get X-Men Adventures number one. This starts the part of the list, Brian, that I get really excited about. This, this starts the part of the list where it starts to get cheap, and it starts to get a little out there. you got to really look at long-term plays. Now, this X-Men Adventures book is kind of hot right now because ever since the Disney Plus app added those X-Men icons. People have made all kinds of assumptions from the animated show is coming back to we're getting a full slate of live action shows and all kinds of things. So this book is spiking now because of that. But you know what? I've always thought, Brian, that this is an underrated book. It's kind of commonly thought of as a kid's book. Back in the day, it was put on the sh kid's shelf. It went to a lot of kids. This is the book that's based on the animated series. And it's the first issue. So it's like the first appearance of that animated classic X-Men. I feel like, though, this is a double play. And this is why you should be buying this book right now. First off, 
I think it's valid to call it the first appearance of the animated X-Men. I think that, uh, to me, there's value in that. Um, and if they go do future projects, this book is certainly going to be a book that people pay attention to. But even if they don't, look at the nostalgia behind the original cartoon. When the Disney Plus app debuted, Brian, how many people were talking about that cartoon? That was one of the consistent things. Yeah, especially anyone in the comic community and just fans of people that nostalgia that grew up in the 90s. So that makes me believe that this comic is undervalued. It doesn't get looked at the way Batman Adventures does. So I really see a lot of room for growth here. This is a tough book to find in good condition. I dare you to go out there and find a raw 9-8. And towards the bottom of that list, at number four, we get X-Men number 96. Yeah, now this one is kind of the opposite of what I was just saying. We're talking about a kind of a big dollar key, um, but an undervalued key. And here's what I'm going to say about this. This is the first appearance of Moira McTaggart, who, of course, was like the centerpiece of the House of X and Powers of Ten story. Um, we saw her in the Fox film franchise. She didn't really move the needle. Honestly, this book wasn't even a key throughout that time. Nobody was really paying attention to it. Now, my key collectors are going to argue and say, well, this book was always a key. Nobody talked about this book amongst major X-Men books as far as the speculation and resale investment community. Nobody saw this as a book that was really going to gain. And then Jonathan Hickman changed everything. I have to believe that Disney is sitting there, Brian, looking at what that series did and really the impact it has had going forward on readers and how many people are now reading these various X-Men titles. And every time you and I say anything even remotely thought of as negative about a current X-Men title, boy, do people come out in defense. So I got to believe that Disney and Marvel, they're seeing this success and at some point are if not adapt that entire story, take elements of it. And I think that because of that, that character has a ton of legs. So it's truly, truly undervalued, even at the price that it's at. And here's the other thing, classic X-Men number four, that's really a second print. It's the reprint. It's totally under the radar and it's tough to find in good condition. Then at number three, Jack was just talking about X-Men Classic, and here we get X-Men Classic number one. Well, that's right. I said that to say this. X-Men Classic number one is a totally undervalued series, Brian. I don't think people are even aware of it. It reprints all of these classic X-Men stories. Now, I just mentioned the reprint or second printing of the first appearance of Myra McTaggart, but you know what? If you're talking about X-Men classic number one, we're talking about giant size X-Men number one. So a lot of people don't realize this, Brian. Look at the price of giant size X-Men number one. It's really untouchable. Outside of my budget. <laughs> and back in the day, they didn't do second prints. So you didn't have that option. So this is the way Marvel handled it. They had series like Marvel Tales or classic X-Men. My overall long-term play is I think Marvel Tales and, and X-Men classic are going to come around in someday these type of series that Marvel put out are going to see their time in the sun. Um, and I'm not at all saying that a book should overtake or be in any sort of a near price range. But I think for a lot of people, this book holds value. It's an opportunity to own a giant size X-Men number one, be able to read it um, and still not be buying like a modern facsimile issue. Also, here's the other thing. This is a classic art Adams X-Men cover. This is one of those covers that when you see our Adams at convention, he has, you know, kind of prints and on his back placard. This is a, a image that is truly iconic. Also white cover, really tough to find in high condition as is most of this series. But I really think that this is a classic book, whether or not it ever um, gets its day in the sun. I don't know, but I think it can only go up in value. It's from 1986. It's only going to get older. It's only going to get tougher and it's only going to get harder to find in high grade. And then coming in that second to top spot at number two, we get uncanny X-Men number 244. Now, look, I know a lot of people are really partial to the Claremont X-Men run, no doubt. 
But I have talked about on this channel several times that I really think going forward, Disney is going to play off that 90s nostalgia, that 90s Jim Lee X-Men run, that 90s cartoon. They're going to play off that 90s nostalgia as that age group of kids is really coming into control and buying power. Um, and really no character kind of was more synonymous with that run than Jubilee. Um, Jubilee was such a kind of main character during those times. And her first appearance does not sell like one. You're talking about a $10 book. Um, it really always been cheap. Uh, was poorly done in the movies in the past, no doubt. But again, we got to wipe the slate clean of that Fox. I really wish that we had one of those Men in Black mind erasers for all of us so we can let go of all of those Fox movies that tend to warp our brains when we start looking at investing in the future of the X franchise with Disney and Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think if again, my play is right, and I'm going to double down on that, then I definitely think Jubilee is a major, major character to see. And it's so cheap, can't hurt, can't go down from where it's currently at, and really has a lot of potential to be worth a lot. It's just a major casting away. Yeah, I agree. I think also that you, you make a good point about that 90s series, because I think one, that series is more accessible to people. And then two, the demographic for people going to movie theater is kind of be around that age group where the people that grew up in the 90s are the ones that are probably going to be buying the, the movie tickets. So it makes more sense to make movies about those type characters. I, I of course, is more of a, I'm not a huge X-Men fan in any means, but yeah, I identify more with like the Claremont as far as reading potential. But I definitely remember in the 90s, but that's also when I kind of broke away from comics for a little bit once in the Marine Corps and then came back and 2008 2009 but either way well aware of it and there's a great points and we're gonna get into the number one pick at the number one spot and that is x-men number one from 1991 and this is the one i fully expect people to be like you have to be kidding me i know this has the all-time record you know how many copies of these there are the highest printed book of all time i'm aware of it but here's the thing no one talks about, Brian. You know why it's the highest printed book of all time? It's the most popular comic of all time. It, it, it was a phenomenon. And here's the thing. We're talking years and years and years later, and it is still iconic. Those covers are still gorgeous. That set and the concept of multiple variant covers, I mean, look at what's going on in the market right now. That book is really the basis of everything that goes on, whether you feel like that's good or bad. So and Plus, you're not saying it's the top. You're saying it's your top underrated. It's top underrated because it's slept on. Anytime I've ever heard any investor bring up that they think that this is a book that people should be paying attention to, they get slaughtered. And you hear the same thing over and over and over again. But... What did I just say when we talked about Jubilee? I'm really bullish that, that Marvel and Disney, they're going to play on this 90s nostalgia. These books will be at the centerpiece of that. They are the iconic books. And the other thing is they're so important to comics history. Um, if you're a collector, if you're a comics historian, how important are these books? You just have to have this set in your collection. All the covers, the special edition, you got to have them. And I think as time goes on and the generation of comic collector changes, we're going to see this younger generation that we just mentioned. That's the generation going to theaters. They're also the generation going to comic conventions. And they're starting to buy books that the previous generation spent a long time thumbing their nose up at. Books like Spider-Man number one. Books like Amazing Spider-Man 365, the first Spider-Man 2099, and books like this. Books that previously a lot of people didn't see value in because it, they just are so burnt from that crash that those who missed that crash, who came in after, who don't have those bitter feelings, they feel nothing but pride and nostalgia over these books. These, to me, are must-own it in 9.8. It's tough to get these in 9.8 because a lot of people haven't graded them. Most of the time you see these books, while you can find them dirt cheap, you're finding them in rough condition raw. Now, I wouldn't set a high buy for these. I'm not telling you to go out and pay $10, $15 each for these books. I look for these books between a dollar and $3, preferably more on the dollar range because a lot of people are 
more than happy to get rid of them. And if you buy them like I do, as I buy them every time I see a dollar, you'll definitely get some of the uh, lesser covers more than the ones that feature Wolverine and the, you know, the heroes and things. But that's okay, because I really think in the long term, all of these covers are going to be popular. This set is going to be popular. And this iconic issue is going to stand the test of time, because I don't know about you, Brian. I don't see anybody breaking that sales record. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. I, I don't see that. That's one that's going to stand around for a while, especially, I mean, it's hard given the time period that it took place and it's a different comic. Well, especially right now, it's different comic industry, but get past this and moving on. But either way, number one, great list, Jack. Thanks for providing that for us. Those are the top 10 underrated X-Men keys from Jack. Also, we also talk about this list is kind of affordable, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's affordable and attainable for you. So that's the reason why we, you know we wanted to highlight these. I think all of these are great investments. I think all of them will matriculate. But the greatest thing is, no matter what comic budget you're on, there's a book on this list that you can afford, and I think you'll believe it. So affordable and accessible. Seems like there's probably quite a few X Men keys that are like that. Jack, did you have a hard time coming up with this list of ten? Oh, absolutely. Anytime you're making these top 10 lists, there's always a multitude of books that kind of almost make the cut, but just barely get left off. So make sure you stay tuned because we're going to show you a number of books that were honorable mentions. They just barely missed the cut, but they're definitely books that you should be on the lookout for. So for Simple Men's Comics, I'm Jack. That was Brian. Stay tuned for the next video.